Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Intentional Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Campion, and I am delighted to bring you this conversation today with the one and only Kevin Kelly. If you don't know Kevin, he is the quote-unquote senior maverick at Wired Magazine, a publication that he co-founded in 1993. He's also the author of many books, often technology-themed, including The Inevitable, Out of Control, The Silver Cord, and What Technology Wants. He uh, wrote a three-volume opus on the disappearing cultures of Asia, titled Vanishing Asia, with some absolutely beautiful photography in it. Uh, And he is the author of a new book, which sums up a life's collection of timeless advice for living, titled appropriately enough, Excellent Advice for Living. In the conversation, Kevin and I talk about artificial intelligence. Of course we do. It's the topic of the day. And we talk about uh, new generative AI technologies like chat GPT. So I think you'll find that really interesting. Um, And then we dive in on his new book, Excellent Advice for Living, which I highly, highly recommend. And I will personally be buying many copies to give to uh, friends and family members as gifts. And also just to leave a couple copies lying around in the hopes that my kids might find them. So just a lot of great stuff in this conversation, and I think you're really going to love it. Um, Before the conversation with Kevin, I just wanted to remind you, uh, if you are interested in hearing more from great people like Kevin Kelly, I do publish a bi-weekly newsletter that's every two weeks, sharing the best of what I'm learning from incredible people just like Kevin. I try to break down the habits, the routines, the motivations, Uh, all the stuff that underpins the success of top performers, often the guests on this very podcast, and deliver them to you in what I hope is a digestible and actionable format. You can find the link to the newsletter in the show notes to this podcast, or just go to gregcampion.substack.com to subscribe. With that, please enjoy this conversation with Kevin Kelly. All right, Kevin Kelly, welcome to the Intentional Wisdom Podcast. Oh, it's really my privilege and honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me. This Uh, is going to be fun. It really is. I'm I'm so uh, just grateful to have you here. Um, I I was mentioning to you before we started recording that I've just been a fan of your work for a long time. Um, As a as a creator myself, of course, I go back and look at your original article from I think it was 2008 on a thousand true fans. Sure, that's been kind of a guiding north star for me, and I think many other. Uh, creators, but uh, but lots of your other books and articles and everything else you've been involved with for so many years has uh, inspired me and many others. So like I said, I'm just super grateful to- well, I'm to glad to hear time. it. Thank you. Um, great. Well, uh, we are here to talk about two different things today. One is uh, to talk about your new book, uh, Excellent Advice for Living, uh, which I have just finished and loved and highly recommend to all of my listeners. Uh, but two, I think I would be remiss not to take this opportunity to discuss some technology topics with you, given your vast experience uh, writing for 30 plus years for Wired Magazine, multiple books, et cetera, et cetera. And there is just a tremendous amount of going on in the world of technology right now. So if you're okay, I wouldn't mind starting there. Yeah, let's open up the floodgates. Um, I mean... The problem is, by the time we finish this conversation, within twenty minutes, everything will have changed. I know. I, I was I was actually thinking that because I was like, I just it's saw like, the. Uh... It was like literally, literally by the hour, uh, things are moving really fast. It's so, inc- yeah. um, so yeah. with that caveat, yes, let's begin. It's incredible. I was I was just thinking the same thing because I saw the. I think it's Sam Altman who's the uh, founder Open and CEO of OpenAI. And I saw he just tweeted out something that said, happy 10-day birthday to GPT-4. And I was like, oh my God, it's only been 10 days that this newest iteration is out there. And my Twitter feed is full of all kinds of apps that people have already built and everything else. Um, So let's start there. I'd love to, to, you know, obviously the the real topic of the day is artificial intelligence. And it feels Mm -hmm. to me, someone who does not live and breathe the world of technology every Mm -hmm. day, but it feels to me like We've been hearing about AI. We've been seeing it sort of here and there, yeah. starting to proliferate into our lives a little bit. And then, bam, chat GPT yeah. hit, and it's like the big bang. Um, right, right. Yeah, uh, so, so, so um, yeah, you're right. This is 
the 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 background noise so the, the whisperings have been gone for for decades and in fact most of the things that these current the wow engines that we're talking about um are not doing new things what's What's given this big bang, this sort of sudden surprise and fast-moving stuff, is the fact that we now have an interface to these AIs, which is like we can talk to them, they can talk. So what they're doing is actually not that new. Hmm. Um, what's what's new is this, now we have an interface, and it's, it reminds me a little bit of the early uh, web, the rush and the excitement, which, again, that was the internet was not new by 92 93 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was just really hard to use you had to do programming you had a line command it was text you had to type you had to know a little bit of programming just to log on the web changed it because now you had finally you had an interface it was a visual interface it was, you could see things move around and that was that was the big bang that was like everybody oh i mm -hmm. get it now i can i can have access to it now and that's sort of what we're seeing with this generative the chat and the uh, and the image generators the the things that they're doing are really not that new hmm. but we have this sudden universal interface of like talking to it in conversation really not just kind of like alexa version, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they really do understand what we're doing and that is just like that's the big thing hmm. and so um now with with that it's going to be embedded into everything. So, um, you know, by 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 the day, you know, Slack, uh, Adobe, you know, Microsoft, Google, they're all like they're going to put in this little interface, this this language interface to everything, so we can use various levels of smartness and various levels of, of capabilities. But we're going to have this conversational interface with it, so we can describe and, and um, use words or text or typing and talk to it back and forth. It's mm -hmm. conversational mm -hmm. meaning, which is very important. It's not just that, like, so you can't have a conversation with Alexa. Mm -hmm. My two-year-old tries. Uh, yeah, yeah basis, you try but, to. Yeah. You want to, and you think it should. Yeah. But Alexa will, you know, will, will transform it very quickly, and you'll have a conversation, meaning that, you, you know, it remembers what you said this minute ago, yeah. right? I mean, it's going to kind of have more continuity. You can get deeper in it. And so that's the that's the big bang is is this um, universal interface and what we um, what they're turning into all these things at many levels is w what I'm calling the universal personal intern. Mm -hmm. We're getting interns, these assistants. They are um, the best use of them, the way that people are winding up using them, whether they're coders using Copilot or whether there's writers using ChatGPT or artists doing um, image generators with Midjourney and Dolly, what 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 you're getting out of it is 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 an intern, someone to work with you. Um, they're really great at the blank page, starting you off, kind of giving organizing your thinking, doing some research getting stuff together and then they're really good also at filling in details filling in places where we could do it ourselves but it really takes a lot of work mm -hmm. to do it and they could just generate 10 of them in an instant so um, particularly this synthesis they're really good at synthesizing things that's one of the real traits humans can do this mm -hmm. it just it's very laborious for us mm -hmm. and they can do it at speed and that's the the virtues is you know like in between stuff you know something that's in between picasso and men go a painting that's got both of them or you know uh weird historical things what if the romans had invented gunpowder what would happen then mm -hmm. and so it would require kind of mastering roman history and history of gunpowder but they can do that and and we could do that but it would take a phd to do it and they're going to just do it in a few seconds so uh but what they produce is interns' work. It's we still need to make it better. It tends to be kind of middle of the road, wisdom of the crowd, average human mm -hmm. kind of thing, and they need to be pushed and prodded to do something 
more edgy or distinctive. And, and in fact, frankly, they need us humans to do something that us. So, so I need to be involved into making it really me. And um, that's, you know, to release your the intern's work as your own is embarrassing because we're going to notice. And, yeah. um, you know, they're just, you're just your intern. So, um, so that's the, that's the bigger story that what's going on. That, that's kind of my high level appraisal. I like the, I like the metaphor, the intern metaphor. I think that's really appropriate based on, so I, I've tinkered with it a good bit. I think you've probably spent more time with it than I have. And I've been enjoying your daily pieces of art <laughs> on Twitter that you've been yeah, yeah. Uh, generating. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've not published anything yet mm -hmm. that, uh, that I've even had a draft uh, from ChatGPT yet, um, but I can see that it's quickly heading that direction. And in fact, in my day job, so I work for a large uh, asset manager producing content, uh, funny enough, and in my day job, just even in the past couple of weeks, it has gone from, uh, wow, this is an interesting thing. We should write something about this to we we 100% need this like right away. Um, for our for business purposes, uh, this is going to make us massively more efficient. So, but the, but I, I I totally take on board everything you say about you would not publish the intern's work. Maybe you right. get to a, a a point where you can train it uh, to your own specifications and your own brand voice right, right. and all this kind of stuff to get it pretty darn close. Um, but that right. that's going to take some more human input. Right, and. Um... And, and another thing about that is um, the bulk of the stuff that we're producing with the generative stuff, whether it's tech, copy, uh, you know, assets, paraphernalia, uh, of visual nature, illustration, whatnot, is, is mostly going to be used in places where they're blank right now, where there's nothing. It's not like you're going to take art that's being generated by humans and replace it with AI, we're going to put it in places where there isn't art. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm noticing, that people who put out newsletters where they're not illustrations, now they're going to illustrate it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they're going to, you know, a lot of this formulaic, prescriptive kind of generating stuff, you know, sports scores, whatever, that's that's going to be replaced because it is a formula and um, it's not necessarily going to replace um, a human is like with things we wouldn't have even written before at all. Um, now we can kind of generate and put it in, and there it is. Um, and so, um, so I also will make a prediction to our listeners is that you're not going to lose your job to AI. Mm -hmm. Your job description may change. Mm -hmm. You may lose your job description, but you're not going to lose your job. Your tasks will, will shift. Some tasks will go away, but um, no, th th this is, in fact, I, I, there are going to be whole new, you know, categories. I saw on LinkedIn three different ads, want to add help wanted ads for prompt engineers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at like $200,000 a year. You know, it's like, um, so. A new so, career so, that has come out of, basically right. come out of nowhere, right? right. In the last Prompt months. engineering. Yeah. So, 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 so there, the, yeah, there's going to be. Lots of uh, new things to do with these, um, and just like Google replaced the task of a lot of librarians for doing you know, searching, so there were there were there were some people who had, there were super searchers who made their living searching the what came before the internet and the web, which was dialogue, which was all the digital digital information there were super searches who were paid and 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 they and they you they were charged like a 60 dollars a minute like a dollar a second or something crazy to to search and and yeah those few people um, may have lost their job but um everybody became they had a personal librarian that, that you were using and the number of new businesses and new people that came out of having mm -hmm. search was huge. It was really huge. Yeah, yeah. And for most people, it, it did not affect them. So there, there may be one or two. I, I think. I, I also, I think the um, there were a very few number of people who were doing medical transcriptions. They doctors would 
dictate, like say, radiologists, and they would see an x-ray, they would dictate what they were saying, somebody would transcribe that into text to pass around. That's all done by AI now. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so that's an example of uh, uh, an occupation that did go away because, but it was relatively small and uh, uh, there may be some equivalents like that. For the most part, you're not going to lose your job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that You know, that's interesting to hear you say because I think there is a tremendous amount of fear-mongering around AI generally. AI is going to take our jobs. AI, humans are going to lose the ability to write eventually if they never do it, to do math, to make even to make art if they never do it. Um, uh, and ultimately, the, you know, the, the biggest worry of all, AI is going to turn on us at some point and we're going to have some uh, apocalyptic uh, disaster. So I, I would say it sounds to me like you're not in the fear mongering. Uh, no, I'm quite the opposite. I'm, I'm radically optimistic about this as a way to move forward, as a new uh, source of employment and jobs and just very excited by the way in which this is going to help us to be better humans. Yeah, yeah. Um, curious, w- is there any advice you would give to folks who, like, let's say they're not super tech savvy? Um, mm. Curious how how you would recommend they position themselves. So whether whether it's somebody mid career or whether it's a high school kid, be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well. well so I have this new book called Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom of Which You've Known Earlier. And one of the advices I give to like a young person, there's a couple of career-ish advices. One of them is um, try to work on things where there's no word for what it is that you're doing because um, get ahead of your language where you kind of have to, it takes a while to explain to your mother what it is. It's very complicated. And you're more likely there to be working somewhere that is, where the breakthroughs are coming from, where the new novelty, where the new wealth will be happening, where, uh, um, by the way, there's also very little competition. The way, the way I've been saying is that, you know, compared to 30 years from now, as we look back, we'll realize there are no AI experts right now. Mm. You can become the AI expert as easily as anybody else. Yep. It's kind of like social media 15 years exactly, ago. Exactly. Right, right, right. right. And, um, and, there, and there's, um, and you're more likely to find this thing this place where there's something only you can do and so um that's the first bit and the second bit is uh, kind of a little bit anti-career advice which is uh, when you're very young if you all can afford it manage it wrangle it uh, spend a hunk of time a year or more uh doing something that looks that looks nothing like success Hmm. that's like squandering, crazy, demented, uh, off the charts, hard to explain, maybe dangerous, uh, completely unprofitable, um, memorable. um, And what that will do is that experience will become your touchstone as you age and try to start a career and in many ways will become a kind of a fountainhead for your success mm. that 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 time where you were really trying to goof off and so like what i'm saying is like waste a lot of time with this is at all possible the people who spend a thousand hours playing around with this are going to have a huge advantage mm-hmm. even if you're not particularly if you're not trying to do anything mm-hmm. sensible with it you're you're just going to be wasting time with it that's Perfect. You know what that, you know what that, I don't know if you've thought of this as an example of that, but you, what you're describing right now to me, uh, well, two things come to mind, actually, your own personal journeys around yep. Asia as a young person. Yep. Uh, but secondly, uh, Mr. Beast, who's yep. pr- probably on his way to becoming a billionaire off of YouTube right. videos, but I've heard a couple interviews with him before. And to hear him talk about the amount of time right. he was spending creating YouTube videos, 10, 15 years ago, whatever it right, was right. as a kid, it was just unbelievable amounts of time. And any rational person at the time would have Jeez. said, 
this yeah, kid is wasting your time, wasting completely your life. wasting his life, and right, right, going right, to right. be a complete disaster. Well, this is this is why the young tend to invent all the new things. It's because they can, they're willing to to, to waste time mm. in, in exploring these 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 areas that that there is no market for it at the time. It's it's um, and that's why startups also uh, are able to succeed where the big corporate Fortune 500s can't because they cannot afford to play in that unprofitable area. The bean counters, the accountants won't allow them to spend that those kind of resources where there's no obvious business model. And um, that's where Mr. Beast was. So there was no business model. It was like, well, why are you doing it? And that's, maybe that's another way I should phrase this. If at all possible, send, spend a lot of time where there's no business model for what you're doing. And um, uh, that doesn't guarantee, there's no guarantee that that will lead to success, but there's a higher probability mm -hmm. than it would, yep. given um, there's a higher probability there than actually following some kind of career of established success, the path of previous successes. So, so yes, um, uh, it, could turn out to be a total waste of time and no no but it's much more likely to to be a source for something that's very important in life and yeah yeah well this is a great transition so so let's get into talking about so you mentioned the book um yeah excellent advice for living and i appreciate the title uh a good piece of writing advice i got at one point was um prioritize uh, being clear over being clever uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, don't take that as an insult, please take it as a compliment because I well, think it is extremely clear what this book is about based on the yeah. title. Well, actually, that was not my first title. Mm. My first title turned out to be Taken. Mm. I wanted to call it Pretty Good Advice. but You uh, wanted to call it Pretty Good Advice? <laughs> <right>? Yes. <laughs> okay. That's, a, that's quite <laughs> humble of you. Right. Well, I thought that was a little bit more in the spirit. But anyway, mm. that book was actually taken by somebody that I know, so I definitely could not know. Uh, Rip that off. So anyway, um, uh, yes, be clear. Um, and and by the way, that that's one of my bits of advice is uh, I not a born writer. I don't like to write. I'm a very reluctant writer. Hmm. I write in order to think. It's how I think. Yes. And for me, uh, clear writing is a consequence, and it, it yields clear thinking. And clear thinking gets clear writing. So that kind of clarity is that most. And when I was editing Wired, that was my beef that was my thing was clarity yeah you can do whatever you want it whatever fireworks or whatever lyricism or poetic but it just clear mm -hmm. was my, a uh, my north star it was yes. like it's got, yes. it's got to be clear so um so that kind of so thank you for that but but um uh, i think my advice to people is if you want to have Clear thoughts. Try try writing, writing it down. You don't really understand something until you can write it. Yeah, that's what happens to me. Is I think I know what I'm talking about, and then I start to write it, and I realize I have no idea yep. what I'm talking about. I need to go back and understand better, and I'll come back and rewrite it. And I think I know what I'm saying, and then I realize halfway through, even the rewrite is like I still don't know. It's still not clear <laughs> to me. So um, I need to go back more, and that process is very painful and that first draft is just a killer and yeah. by the way that's why the ai is helpful is kind of making that first draft there so they have some clarity the intern has some clarity but it's not enough i've got to go back on around and around but um that for me that first draft is always the, the most painful yeah yeah well that's encouraging i think for folks to hear because someone with your writing chops to hear mm -hmm. that it's still a struggle for you yeah, uh, I think that's encouraging. Um, I'm hundred percent with you on the writing to think uh, as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, um, I do that on a daily basis. One of my goals for this year is to write for thirty minutes a day, and it could be wow. about anything. And it is really, right. um, it is. I I don't really know what I think uh, until it's down on paper because. Right. Exactly. There are so many ideas floating around up here and there's so many right, right, stimulus right, right, right. coming in and everything else. And it's like, okay, why don't I sit and write it and then I can look at it and then 
And by the way, it's a great sort of relief for stress and anxiety and everything else too, to have it out of here and onto a piece of paper. Exactly. So, so again, to complete the image that you kind of began, for me, it's not like, um, I, I, the, the writing down of the ideas make them clear. It's even more extreme than that. Mm. I don't have the ideas mm-hmm. until I write. Yep. It's that process of trying to write that the ideas come. Mm-hmm. So it's really weird. It's not like, okay, I finally got it in my head. I'm going to try and put it down into the right words. No, 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 no. It's like trying to find the right words gives me the idea. It's like I'm, it's like I'm channeling it in a weird way. Yep. And so that's the... That's the beauty and the stupid that unless I try and write it, I don't even have the idea. Mm. Mm. It's a, I experienced the same thing. It's a strange dichotomy. It reminds me almost of um, uh, mood following action rather than yep. action following mood. Exactly. So, same sort right. of thing. Uh, when I when I go out and exercise and it's not, I don't need to be in the right mood to exercise. I need to exercise to get in the right mood. Right, that right. sort of thing. Yeah, it's someone else to kind of describe it as kind of, you know, being action oriented. Action is the source, is the source of, of, of life that you, you, you do it through action. Mm-hmm. You change your mind through acting it out. You literally smile in order to make you happier. Yep. And so this idea of acting out is true for writing too, for thinking is that you act out. And that is another a bit of advice I have, which is, Try to think outside of your brain. Go for a walk. For me, that's great. Use your hands and write things in a notebook. This idea of like the extended brain, the extended mind can act out thinking with your whole body, not just your your, your brain. Hmm. Um, okay, so the I just want to paint a little picture for our listeners here. So, so your book is it's a very uh, short. Uh, compact read, I guess I would say. Uh, I'm I'm almost thinking about it as I don't know if you would take this as an insult or not, but I'll say it anyways. I'm almost I am almost thinking of it as like a coffee table book, or it's the kind of book I want to leave as a parent. I want to leave lying around the house. It's a right, lying around the right. book. I want people right. to pick it up and yeah, leave through yeah. it, especially my it, kids. It 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 is, it is that kind of. Um, it's not meant to be read linearly. It's a kind of dip in and out. Of, uh, it says reminders um, but yes I think uh, le- a laying around book would be ideal I like that phrasing or mm-hmm. like that notion the image of a, the laying around book the book that's kind of later around you kind of go into it um, almost like a, um, you know again I'm not overselling this but like a, having a scripture where you kind of like go into it mm-hmm. the, the original subtitles were something along the lines of seeds of contemplation mm-hmm. meaning that the idea was that these are a little seed that you kind of contemplate yeah. and let unpack them in your own life in a certain way um, the, the i spent a lot of time trying to compress a big book of advice of wisdom into one little sentence and then with the hope that you would unpack that to get more out of it for your for yourself mm-hmm. um so, so um, yes, and that, and that that kind of encapsulation was what I spent most of my time on to, to make it telegraphic into this little um, capsule that you could make it handy to pick up mm-hmm. that you could pick up and I wrote them originally for me so I could pick them up and remind myself mm-hmm. about different things that where I was trying to change my own behavior and so um, so now you know again these are sort of sometimes there are little bits that seem eternal, evergreen, timeless wisdom, you know, uh, I'm reading here, if you can avoid seeking approval of others, your power is limitless. Mm-hmm. You know, like you really do want to be more internal driven, if at all possible, you can, you can learn to do that a little bit more. Um, if everyone's time is finite, that's true for you and me, and shrinking, and the highest leverage you can get with your money is to buy someone else's time. Mm-hmm. So hire and outsource when you can. That took me such a long time to kind of arrive there. I was a 
do yourself hippie kind of guy. It just my bias was to do things myself. Hmm. I didn't get I didn't start an internet company when the internet was starting because I couldn't program, and I didn't realize you could hire programmers. That's what that's the genius of Mitch Kapoor, who started you know Lotus One Two Three, became a billionaire because. He says, I couldn't program for life in me, but I could hire programmers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, like, concept what? of leverage do... is a big one. Oh, my yeah. gosh. So, um, yeah, so, so, this, so, so, so the most precious resource you have is your time. Mm-hmm. Therefore, the most highest leverage you can do is to get someone else to work on your thing. And so, like, yeah, so that's what you should be doing is if, if you could convince someone else to give you some of their time, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh. Or that if is, you have a digital intern, or you have a digital intern, yeah, exactly. So, so, so that is um, anyway. So, so that's, I'm just reading randomly, like as so, we so, said. So, I, as I was mentioning to you before we started recording, I, I I started going through the the book with an intention to just highlight ones that I wanted to bring up with you in yeah. particular. By the time I got to the end, half the book was highlighted, and I cut that down and cut that down and cut that down, and we'll probably only get to like one fifth of what I have on this piece of paper okay, in front of me. But, one, uh, this, hopefully that would be good incentive for people to yeah. go buy the book. Um, so let, let me just throw a few out at you that I'd love to hear you talk a little bit sure. about, uh, because one, your point around, uh, some of these being more things that you need to sort of contemplate on your own, uh, that stands out to me because there's some in here that I read and I was like, they hit me, but then I was like, I need to spend some time with that one and like <laughs> think more about that one. So let me give you an example. So yeah. one example is this, we lacked we lack rites of passage. Create a memorable mm. family ceremony when your child reaches legal adulthood between 18 and 21. This moment will become a significant touchstone in their life. Um, tell me about that one because it's like, in theory, I'm like, oh, I've got three kids. This sounds like a great idea, yeah. but it's very vague to me still in my head of how sure. we would uh, do right. that. So I have, I have three kids too and recognizing this absence of ritual in our lives we decided to make a ritual a family ritual for this and, and let me just say parenthetically that's another bit of advice to anybody who has parents and kids is uh, one of the few regrets they have which was not to make more rituals make as many rituals in your life as you can and the rituals are, can be anything that you repeat more than three times in a row right it could be the most insignificant things like we i made pancakes every sunday morning for like 20 years whatever it was, and that became this anchor, this idea that um, it was something that you can count on, that kids kind of crave that that anchoring, the stability, and lots of things are changing their lives, and people move around, you know, there's just lots going on, that, that these little rituals, whether they're seasonal, weekly, or monthly, or on certain occasions, birthdays, they're so easy to make and they become so important if they if you repeat them in the anticipation of them what what, what would be another example like i, I love the the pancake what, well like um uh you know um things that you do like so you know like in a holiday thing you know every christmas we do this, there's a whole sequence of things that we do and they look forward to that or a month or you know we have a, a movie night every every month yep. on on a certain time and or we watch the same movie every year at something yeah. or um before before we set off well in our family we say grace before a meal mm-hmm. okay we hold hands and say grace and that is that's anchoring that's that's reliable that's comforting that's that's and, and it does other things in terms of actually helping the kids have a family identity which is really really important if they can have a family identity that gives them again uh, a platform to make their own identity. You get a little bit more confidence in doing that. So um, uh, I've heard, you know, like um, I have a friends who do technical sabbaths, which we also kind of tend to do, which were very, very important. And our family does this, and their families do that. And okay, that's how it is. But there is this little ritual of once a week you put down your screens. Incredibly liberating, incredibly powerful. You have to do other things. Um, there can be um, things that you do um, when you're um, going to take off on a vacation of any sort. There's there's a little thing, a little ceremony, a little ritual. So that's those are the kind of trivial things. But the coming of age one was a little more important and different. And 
um, we devised a little ceremony that was modified for the three kids and had their input in kind of devising what would you like to do in addition to what we do um, to bring that meaningfully to you. So the thing that we did in common was um, we had a little ceremony, we wrote a passage with some of the close family members and if they wanted anybody else, that they were there. And then we had a red ribbon that my wife and I ha had around our waist and that went out and went around their waist, this red ribbon, and we had a scissors. And we ceremonially cut the cord mm. of this thing. That was the beginning of the ceremony. We're cutting the cord. We um, had a, a toast with their first legal drink of wine, mm -hmm. toast to them and toast to their passage. We gave them two check. We gave them one check We because we, we had a wager with the kids built on my own wager that I did with my dad that if they didn't smoke or drink until 21, they'd get $1,000. So the ones who did that, not all of them did, got $1,000. And then they got the, all of them got their last check. We gave them the last check hmm. that we were going to give them. Kind of like, this is the, this is our support. Mm -hmm. This is the last one you're now on your own. You are responsible for hmm. henceforth. So, um, and then there were other things. And so, my um, son, he said um, he wanted everybody to, um, we got some edible ink and paper and everybody, he wanted all the people present to write down some advice mm. to him that he would then eat. Really? He read it out loud and then ate it. Okay. That's so interesting. It was like, it was like communion. Yeah. So that's then, two examples in the, that you've given now that are physical. And so that, yeah, yeah. To, to me and... For some reason, you know when you see something and then you see it everywhere. Right, right. Um, I, I, I was just had a, a guest by the name of Todd Herman on the show, and he was saying, uh, you know, he was talking about this idea that we get imposter syndrome because we don't do a good job uh, showing ourselves uh, or reminding ourselves of our wins. And so he's like, I have a jar right, right. on my desk, and every time I have a win, I put a poker chip in it. Right? Sure. So it's like this physical activity and it's this physical thing that I'm staring at on my desk. Right, right, like, right, right. How can I be an imposter? Look at all these wins I have in this <laughs> jar, right? Yeah, right. Great. Great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The physical stuff. So my son didn't follow through. He says, I also well, want to go down to the beach, which we're not, we're only a mile from the beach. He says, I want to, um, I want to um, run in as a boy into the waves and walk out as a man. Hmm. That's so the third kind of physical a, thing you mentioned. A yeah. baptism kind of thing. Yeah. My daughter, my eldest daughter, actually wanted to be baptized in our hut. Huh. Uh, which I, well, okay. And then my second daughter, her little thing was she baked bread for uh, herself, and then she fed the bread to everybody. And yeah. she had a couple other uh, ceremonies of, mm -hmm. um, I can't remember exactly what they were right now. But they were also getting physical of like sharing things and, having i think maybe she had everybody hold hands I, yeah so 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 there was there was again they were involved in kind of creating this this ceremony for themselves yeah. as well as the kind of the cutting of the cord and giving last shake and head i like that it's so like personalized as opposed yes. to you know your standard you know you have things right, right, in different right. religions like right, uh, you right. know you're confirmed or whatever and it's right, kind right. of the standard thing i like how personalized right. that that you yeah. your family so made it. so um but what, the important thing is that there was that there was a ceremony, yeah. there was a ritual, there was a time. So that is the say, line of demarcation. That, yeah, exactly. This is you're taking over. We are we are kind of supporting you in your new role in life as an independent mm -hmm. person, and we you know, we are fortunate in this because after that at 21, we did not support our kid. They have been self. -support. And so uh, that's been that's been does great. That, does that conflict with your advice to give away everything before you die? Well, okay. Um, there will be a time when um, well that would change, but um, right now as young adults, we we feel that it's not on the own. best time. Yeah. So 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 I would say just in complete honesty. Um, we are helping them with a purchase of their home 
because it's literally impossible to do that in the Bay Area Got otherwise. Yeah. So, so, so that's where we have um, been instrumental, and that's where we're using our kind of next generational thing is in down payment that's cool. for a home, even though they are supporting the mortgage, there was no way they can do that. And that's how we can. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay. I want to bring up another one here. This, sure. this one actually started to make me cry for some reason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, it's kind of, it can be related to teach, uh, to kids though, depending on how you yeah. read it. Uh, but it's, you need teachers, parents, mm. customers, fans, and friends because they will see who you are becoming before you will. For yeah. some reason, I get emotional when I read that. Um, tell me about that one. Um, well, it, it's it's you know one of my bits of advice. I'm not sure if it was on your list or not. Which is you know to 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 don't aim to be the best. Aim to be the only. Mm -hmm. That that that, that we're, we should be aiming kind of become the fullest you, the best you, the best we, I, that I can be. And um, it's so there's this weird paradox that in order to be the most unique individual, you need everybody, you need a whole, you need everybody around you. You can't do that alone. Mm -hmm. You can't become an individual alone. It's kind of like a paradox, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There are lots of paradoxes in life, but that's one of them. You can't be an individual alone. You need everybody around you because the thing is, is that I, we are so opaque to ourselves. We we, we we just cannot see ourselves. The the weird way that our own minds and consciousness are constructed is that we're unable to access our identity, our wisdom, our talents, or whatever it is by ourselves. We need these people around us to see us, to work with us, to give us, you know, to check us, to guide us, to see us. Um, and so, so that process of trying to become something, often people around us see that before we see it. Yeah. And that's a good thing. So, so that means that you need to be engaged with them in order to understand and become your best in yourself. And, and so that's, um, that's wonderful. That's great. That, that's why they're here. That's why they're in your movie. Is there, there is a supporting cast to help you be the star. You want to make sure you're in your own movie, though, and not an extra in someone else's movie. And so um, that is um, how it's done. So the way to become the most unique individual is that you need everybody else around to do that. Yeah. it's To me, that one almost goes back a little bit to imposter syndrome in, in some yeah. ways. So I think back to... You know, for instance, even just this this podcast, um, and I had a friend recently say to me after I had a fairly high profile guest on the podcast, and she said, "I think you just went from a guy who has a podcast to a guy who has a podcast," <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was kind of like, "Wow, okay, that's kind of validating." Um, yeah, but yeah. but then I think about it the other way too, and like, so far I think about it from the other perspective, like, how can I? be that person more that is giving that feedback right and so mm -hmm. i think about i'm i'm in a position where i coach youth baseball and youth basketball mm -hmm. right and i'm mm -hmm. like i think back to when i was a kid or even er earlier in adulthood when like somebody made a comment to me whether it was my english teacher telling me i was a great writer or you know these co these piercing yeah. comments that are like a throwaway comment to somebody else yeah. and here it is stuck with you like 35 years later. And so I, I think about that. I almost take that as like a responsibility. And I say, how can I like pay that forward and give that to other people and plant seeds right, for right. them? Yeah. I have a friend um, who's actually a very well-known um, writer and his unique contribution to the world is that he is just a font of affirmation for everybody. Mm. And, um, it sometimes it's so voluminous and so constant that it may seem cheap in that sense. Mm -hmm. But I believe he genuinely feels it, and it doesn't even matter. It's because that affirmation does affect you, and and one of the consequences is, is he's a total joy to be around. 
because he's affirming constantly mm. what people do. And I realized that it's like, it's a very, I'm saying again, very inexpensive way to, to do things. It doesn't, there's no cost really other than deciding to say and affirm what, you know, praise somebody, whatever you want to call it, all those things. It's, it's, it is, we really, I'm, I'm just reminded, I need to do that more. And it could, it could have, because of the effect that it has on other people is so powerful, as you're saying, it could have been just something that maybe didn't, wasn't that important to the person saying it, but it was so important to you. Mm -hmm. And that is a great reminder uh, uh, to do that. Uh, and I probably didn't have enough of those in this, in this book, but thank you for reminding me. One of the other ones that I really liked was um, you talk. You say writing down one thing you're grateful for each day yeah, is the right, cheapest right. form of therapy. Um, right, exactly. Is that something that you practice yourself? I um, don't always write it down, but I try and think it. Mm -hmm. I try. I try to uh, again remind myself. And 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 for me, the way I put it is for me. Um, it's, it's my only prayer. When I pray, the right. only prayer I have is gratitude. Hmm. I have the prayer of gratitude. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the entire thing is, 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 uh, I every day will remind myself of what I am grateful and gratitude and thankful for. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my, that's my prayer. Yeah. And I so, um, that, and I've seen that in others and my kids and stuff is to the extent that able to be grateful it is so healing yeah yeah i'm a big believer in that as well um uh, i've i've actually um there's a appreciation course on headspace that i've used and uh -huh. the whole kind of theory and idea is it's just like a, a series of you know one you do one one class each day and it's only 10 minutes right. and um but the whole kind of theory is it just Instead of just like saying, "Yeah, sure, I'm grateful for my family" or what mm -hmm. have you, it's um, it you're you're visualizing something that at that moment you are very grateful for. So I, I actually just did it um, before we had this podcast, and I was like, "There was two things that came to mind." So you asked yourself the question. You said, "What am I? What am I grateful for right now?" Right. I was really grateful that I was going to get to have a chance to have this conversation, mm -hmm. and I was sitting outside, and it's a nice day here in North Carolina, mm -hmm. and I was really grateful that. I, the feeling of the sun on my face, right? right. Yeah. And then if you want to take it another step further, it is to then write that after you finish, write down right, right. Those, those two or three things. And it, it's just a subtle like rewiring of the brain. And it's something that is so easy to just skip and say, oh, I don't have time for that today. But my gosh, what a change it can have for your mindset. Yeah, 100%. You're right there. You're preaching to the choir. There are people who would really benefit from uh, taking those steps. And again, uh, it is, in my experience, it, as powerful as therapy. Yeah. Um, okay. Another one I really liked of yours. Sorry to keep yeah. peppering you with these, but there's so many. Oh, no, of course. That's here. what I'm here for. Um, embrace pronoia, which is yeah. the opposite of paranoia. Choose to believe that the entire universe is conspiring behind your back to make you a success. So pronoia is not a term I invented. It was coined by a guy maybe 20 years ago, more. And um, it is really, really um, effective. Um, and it's sort of, you know, I've said it elsewhere, other bits of, other bits of advice of... Um, you know, basically, uh, being able to trust people, trust their best. Um, that uh, in that trust, sometimes you may be cheated. Um, someone may steal from you or whatever, take advantage of you. But that's a small to pay for the huge gains that you'll have of being the best because you you trusted them. And so this is a little bit in that same kind of uh, of vein that trusting everybody trusting that everybody else is actually trying to work for your good that, that they're going to give you their best that they are actually wanting you to succeed will in fact um, 
bring forth that. And 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 when someone is not doing that, just think of it as a as a tax that you're willing to pay for all the other overwhelming great things that you've gotten from that. So 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 a, a few examples of people cheating you or not performing well does not obliviate the the benefits of taking that stance of, of, of playing the game that they are inspiring to, to to help you because I think in that is actually the default for most people is they mm-hmm. they do want to be helpful yep. if if they can sometimes you can help them uh, to be grateful and that's one thing I learned hitchhiking I don't think I put it in the book but the thing about hitchhiking is you're completely 100 percent vulnerable depending on other people you are requiring them to to help you and so there's you, you there's a stance that I learned which is to be receptive to being to receive mm-hmm. you have to be ready to receive things and that's not just being needy that's being open to receiving things in kind of a in a kind of a grateful way being being grateful and open it not in a demanding way, mm-hmm. um, being kind of open to the gift and being humble about it and then grateful. And so there is an art to receiving as well as the art to giving. Mm. And that's another thing that we maybe that I learned by, by hitchhiking a lot was to, to be in that position of like, yeah, um, I am, who, who's going to help me today? I am open to this miracle of being picked up and given a ride and, uh, you know, the universe, I'm standing on the side of the road and, and I'm declaring that I believe in the universe. I trust the universe so much I will stand on the side of the road knowing that I'm going to get a ride. Maybe you are the person today that's going to be that, and I am open to that. And so there, there, there is a stance of, of, um, of, kind of believing and relying on the fact that other people do want to help you. That I think is encapsulating this idea of the paranoia. Yeah, I think it's a nicer, much nicer way to go through life, believing that the world is conspiring to help you rather than the world is conspiring to uh, defeat you. Um, uh, I want to point out that you know we've we're so far we've talked about some you know fairly weighty you know <laughs> topics and you know philosophical stuff, but I want to point out that you've also got a lot of just great more practical advice in yeah, here. Yeah, and yeah. so you have things like uh, you increase your chance of successfully removing a clothing stain. If you keep it wet <laughs> while you work on it, it's much harder once it dries out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just practical advice. And yeah, listen, yeah, I'm, exactly I'm, I things love like practical advice. But. Um, if you lose something, yes. I'm, I'm called Mr. Find It in our household. I will always find things, partly because I have a memory. And, and yeah. the question is always, where did you last use it? When did you last were aware of it? And then you search within that area, and it's almost always invariably within an arm's reach of wherever it was last used or seen. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I also began the book making notes when I was learning this thing from my years in making stuff, which is um, if, if I have something in the household, I know that I have it, but I can't find where it is, and then I finally find it. Then when I go back to put it away, I remind myself, don't put it back where I found it. Put it back where I first looked for it. Mm. Put it back where you first looked mm. for it. Yep. Put it back where you first looked for it. And that is um, a bit of a practical advice that I use all the time. So just for our listeners, the, this book is a wealth of information, both on the philosophical uh, to the to the practical, I would say. Right. Um, all right. I just have a couple more questions for you. I know we're, we're going to yeah. be bumping up on time here soon. But uh, one of the things that struck me was um, you said in a hundred years, a lot of what we take to be true now will be proved to be wrong, maybe even embarrassingly wrong. Yeah. A good question to ask yourself is what might I be wrong about? That's the only worry worth having. So my question to you, I don't know if you've gotten this one yet, yeah. but, uh, w- what do you think you might be wrong about a hundred years from now? Um, I still, I don't eat mammals, but I still eat some meat and that might be considered really very, uh, um, savage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, my ancestors may be embarrassed that uh, we're eating flesh of other animals to kill just to eat. Um, 
I may be wrong about um, embarrassing wrong about things like um, we we gave our kids their names and in the future they may be embarrassed that they had a parent assigned names kind of like having your parent assigned partner a parent I think it's likely that names might be something that we self-assign give ourselves our names so that might be embarrassing and uh, I think I might probably have some ideas about how our minds work which I'm sure will be wrong about um, things I thought maybe only humans could do. Like I think um, humans are really good at asking questions and computers aren't, and I could be totally wrong. It may be that maybe they even ask questions better. Yeah. Well, I love that one. It's a great one to contemplate and to think about. Um, I think about things like the writing. We were talking about chat GPT to start this one. And, you know, I kind of think it's going to ultimately help people become much better writers. Could we be wrong? And could writing 100 years from now be seen as a thing people sure. used to do? I, I would be sad if that happens, but it's, I don't know. It, it's not impossible. Um, right. Uh, okay. Well, I need to finish with uh, my standard closing question, which is kind of a little weird to ask you because you've basically just put out a whole book. Uh, that mm-hmm. answers this question, but I'm going yeah. to ask you anyhow. It is, what's one thing that you've figured out in life that most others haven't? Um, I think I figured out that um, you uh, don't that you don't need much to okay I, th- I think you figure that you can make up your own version of success you, you can write your own definition of success okay, here's what it is i'm thinking of this that you succeed the way to succeed is to write to make up your own definition of success and um if you do then you can be wildly successful <laughs> and so I am wildly successful because I have invented my own definition of success. I should write that one down. I think that's for the next, that's for the updated that's version. That's the next book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Craig. That was really great. A lot of fun. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the chance to chat with you and to invent some new advice. So um, Thank you as well. And, and one of the things great. that you said, uh, I think one of the last pieces of advice you give is you say, uh, very few regrets in life are about what you did. Almost all of them right. are about what you didn't exactly. do. Exactly. And I would say, as I look at your career and everything that you've done, you know, when I when I coach my youth baseball team, I say, guys, we're gonna we're gonna leave it all out on the field here. And I think, right. um, as I look at everything you've done and all the various efforts you've been involved with over the years, right. I think you've 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 got. I'm sure you got a lot left to do, but gosh, you've left it yeah. all out on the field. So, um, well, thank you. I yeah. really appreciate the time. Great. Thanks so much, right. Kevin. Talk yep. soon. Thank you so much for listening today, my friends. Uh, Getting a chance to have that conversation was a real treat for me. Um, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that Kevin is one of the most respected thinkers and writers in the world on all things technology. He's also set quite an example of living life to the beat of his own drum. And uh, again, I do highly recommend picking up a copy of Kevin's new book, Excellent Advice for Living. As you can tell from this conversation, I really enjoyed it and can't wait to revisit it myself and share it with friends and family. So definitely check that out. Um, Final reminder, if you'd like to hear from me every other week, I send a bi-weekly newsletter summing up everything that I'm learning from top performers across all industries. It's the people on this podcast. It's the books I'm reading. It's the podcasts I'm listening to. Everything that I'm finding super interesting and useful in my own life, I share with you every other week for free. Find the link in the show notes of this episode or visit gregcampion.substack.com and you can subscribe there. Thank you so much, my friends, and I will see you next time.